Today we're going to be looking at the final lesson of the finance unit on mortgages and where annuities are extremely important as I mentioned during uh, one of the previous lessons. Mortgages are probably second in importance when it comes to understanding your finances because it's probably going to be one of the biggest um, life debts that you're going to have. A debt that probably lasts about 25 to 30 years. So understanding a little bit of the math involved in how to calculate a mortgage is just going to give you a little bit more confidence when you walk into a bank for the first time to ask for a loan for uh, to buy a house. It can be pretty daunting to face, but um, like I said, understanding the math a little bit better just makes things a little bit easier to understand. Um, so when you're buying a house, there are a few extra fees involved besides just the price of the house. I just wanted to talk about a few of these. So you have uh, oftentimes an application fee that you have to pay. Sometimes that's covered by the bank. By the way, before I continue talking about this, I just want to preface that I am not a financial advisor, uh, a little bit out of my comfort zone when it comes to talking about some of these things. I, I have gone through it, but I'm not a, an, a you know, an expert on these terms. So I'm going to give you kind of an overall idea of what they mean. And uh, hopefully, you know, if you need to know more, you can go find that information out or somebody will explain it to you. Uh, so then you might have mortgage brokers fees. Does anybody in chat know what a broker does? So I'm not seeing any answers. Um, so a broker basically, sure. It, well, I need something a little bit more specific than that. So basically what it is, is a person that you're hiring to try to find the best price for you. Uh, <laughs> um, so you're trying to, let's say you wanted to buy a car. I'm terrible at haggling for prices you could actually hire a mortgage broker and they'll haggle for the price. And therefore, I mean, you won't get the best price on the vehicle if you were to do it yourself, but you'll get a better price on the vehicle that if you're not good at haggling, paying them to do that for you. So that's what basically a mortgage broker would do is they would find the best um, uh, mortgage fee or price for you. You're gonna have legal fees. You're gonna have to hire an attorney the attorney is going to look into things like, are there any um, issues with the property of the house? For instance, are there any liens on the house? So a lien uh, is basically, so I'll give you an example. There are very specific rules as to where you can build a fence, for instance. If your fence is on your um, neighbor's side of the lot line, that fence actually belongs to the neighbor. If the fence straddles the lot line or, you know, maybe zigzags across the lot line, there could be issues there when it comes to like wanting to fix the fence or replace the fence. Um, if somebody builds a shed a little bit too far on the, on the properties of the, uh, you know, of the city or even a, of a neighbor, then that could be a lien on the property. So those are the kinds of things that um, a lawyer is going to look into. Another thing they're going to look into, are there any easements? And an easement is usually, and again, I'm not an expert at this, but my lot has an easement with Bell Canada where there's um, phone lines running underneath the ground on my lot at the back of my property. And therefore that technically isn't my property. I can't dig back there because if I cut through their lines, then I could be cutting off the service uh, for some of the neighbors down the street. So. Easements are another thing that you'd want to be interested in uh, when you're about to buy a house. There's going to be land transfer taxes. You could pay for a home inspection. A home inspection is hiring somebody, price is usually about $500, to come into your house and they, they take a look at very specific things. Are there any cracks that are visible in the foundation? Uh, is there the right amount of um, um, insulation in the attic? Um, now they, can, they can't do a lot of things that have to do with like behind the walls. Uh, they won't break through the ceiling or anything like that, but they can look at some of the more obvious things and see if there's any issues and let you know. And what's nice about it, even though you're paying a hefty amount of money for it, they do warranty their work 
and their uh, their um, investigation of your house for a little while. So at least it gives you a little bit of peace of mind. And the last thing you might have to pay for is the uh, CMHC uh, fee, which is usually an insurance against going bankrupt when you're paying back your house. You have to put down a down payment on a house before you buy it. It's between five and 20% of the house usually. If you only put down the minimum amount, they probably will ask you to pay for this insurance because it's kind of showing that you may have a difficulty uh, paying the rest of the house off if you don't have a fair, uh, you know, a big enough down payment. So, um, and down payment is just a sum of money that you're going to drop on the mortgage itself to try to bring it down before you start paying it off. So the bank likes to see a high, a high enough uh, deposit. I'm not sure exactly what the number is to tell you the truth, but it's around, I believe it's around 15, 20%. And then you wouldn't have to pay for anything underneath that. You'd have to pay for that insurance. So what we're going to do to investigate how a mortgage is paid off. Well, let's first talk about what an amortization is. An amortization is, as you can see here, the gradual elimination of a liability. And what happens is you pay regular payments off on this liability, but it's been pre-calculated that those payments cover the interest more than they cover the principal at the beginning. And as the life of the um, amortization, you know, goes on, you'll be paying less and less of the interest and more and more of the principal. And that's because the bank wants to get their amount of money first. Okay. So uh, they, they make sure that the payments that you're putting in the bank are going to pay off the interest before they pay off the actual value of the house. So we're going to use a table to investigate that. And I'm going to quickly move over to a spreadsheet but uh, I'm gonna show you a few little calculations on paper here first. So we're gonna do two different cases. The first case, we're gonna look at a scenario that's pretty similar to the types of investments that we've been looking at recently, which is compounded monthly and paid monthly. The problem is, and you're gonna see this in a few minutes, a Canadian mortgage doesn't work that way. A Canadian mortgage is actually compounded semi-annually and paid monthly. And that means the math gets a little bit messed up and we have to do a little few a few little things to fix it. So I'm not going to do that example first. I'm going to do this one first. So this one's compounded monthly, paid monthly, all right? Um, and if it's compounded monthly, if you take a look at the interest rate here, so the mortgage, the mortgage amount is $112,450, and the interest amount is 12%. So 12% compounded monthly is 0 0.01 interest uh, times your principal every month. A little bit of a caveat here, um, that interest and uh, mortgage payment are probably not reflective of today's numbers. Uh, this note goes back quite a few years and I just haven't updated it recently. Um, but uh, $112,450 for a house, pretty low mortgage, unless you're living in a very small house or in an urban uh, or sorry, rural area. And 12% interest for the interest on a house payment right now is pretty high. They're closer to three, 4% right now but it doesn't matter what the numbers are. The math all works out anyway. So we're just gonna use that example. Uh, so 0 0.01 is our interest amount. So here's what the table looks like. So if you take a look at the uh, titles in the columns, you've got your payment number, which is basically counting up how many months have gone by. You've got your monthly payment amount. Now this amount I want you to notice right off the bat doesn't change. This is a calculated value, and I'm gonna show you how that value is calculated in the second example, because I actually have the tables for those. Um, I can't even actually remember where I got this number, but I want you to notice that the number doesn't change. So that was calculated by the bank to make sure that after 25 years, this has been paid off fully, both in interest and in the principal. Your interest portion, your principal portion, and your principal remaining. And I want you to notice that your principal remaining starts with your original mortgage. So that's your original amount that you borrowed. Okay. Um, so here's how this table works. And it's a little bit complicated. So I'm going to use color to try to help us see what's going on. The first thing you'd want to do, and I know this number is here. Actually, let me use a different color than green here. I know the, col the number is already there, but where did this number come from, this interest portion? Well, this interest portion comes from your interest calculation of P times RT, which we recently changed to P times I, because T is equal to one, okay? 
So our I is 0 0.06, right? Uh, sorry, 0 0.01, my mistake. So we just, just calculated the 12% divided by 12, because it's compounded monthly, is 0 0.01. If you multiply your principal remaining times 0 0.01, you're going to get your interest portion. Now I want you to try to understand this. You're paying 1184.35, 1124.50 of that amount is going just to pay the interest. So how much is left over to pay your, your actual loan off? Well, if we subtract those two numbers, it's going to give us this number here, which is how much is left over of your monthly payment after you've paid the interest to pay off your actual loan. So $59.85 is how much is left over to pay off that $112,000. Uh, $112, to find out what your new principal remaining is going to be for the next calculation, we're going to take these two numbers and subtract them. And that's going to give us that number. So 112,450 minus 5985 gives us 112,390.15. So let me repeat that. You take your principal, multiply by your interest to get your interest portion. You subtract your monthly payment by your interest portion to find out how much left over to pay off your principal. And then you subtract your principal by that leftover to find out what your new principal is. And then you start that all over again. You'd multiply this new principal times your interest to get that number. You'd subtract these two numbers to get that number. And you'd subtract these two numbers to get that number. And very quickly, I'm hoping you can see that if we had a way of automating this, which we do with a spreadsheet, it would go a lot, lot faster. Before I continue, and I know that's a lot to try to grasp, but it, I'm hoping it's not too difficult. If you follow the colors, I hope it helps a little bit. Are there any questions about anything I've just said before we continue? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so let's keep, keep going. We're going to be looking at another table like that very soon anyway, and I'm going to be doing it on a spreadsheet, which, you know, I'm going to take my time and explain how everything works again. But before we do that, I, I now want to start talking about a Canadian mortgage. And the issue with Canadian mortgage is that all the way along so far when we've been doing finance questions that have been compounded, if we, if we are paying monthly, we are compounding monthly. If we're paying weekly, we're compounding weekly with our annuities specifically. Canadian mortgages are weird because they are compounded semi-annually but paid monthly. So those two things don't match. Usually they do. If you're compounding semi-annually, usually you'd be paying semi-annually, but that's not how a Canadian mortgage works. So we need to do a few, uh, one major calculation first before we start using our Canadian mortgage. And this is the only thing that changes with the previous example. We have to calculate an equivalent monthly interest rate, which I like to describe as a fake interest rate that instead of doing semi-annually, does basically the same thing, but converts it into a monthly payment. So that's the biggest thing. The next thing I'm gonna show you as well after I've done that is how did we calculate that monthly payment that the bank comes up with that doesn't change for the 25 years. So let's start with the equivalent interest rate. We're going to use the exact same mortgage, but instead of doing 12% uh, compounded monthly, we're now doing 12% compounded semi-annually, which means divided by two, which means 0 0.06, okay? Well, here's the formula that's going to change that semi-annual to a monthly fake, faked version that works with our math, all right? So the equivalent monthly interest rate formula is this one right here. Now, usually when I see a formula, I like to explain where it comes from. Unfortunately, folks, this is one formula. I have no idea where it comes from. <laughs> so um, you're going to have to just trust that this formula is the one that's used. It's, in, it's out of the textbook, so I, I know it's, it's right. Um, but this is how we calculate that fake monthly interest. I, I think that the one-sixth here has to do with the fact that 
semi-annually means six months out of the year, whereas um, uh, a, you know monthly would be 12 months out of the year. So it has to do with something like that. But anyway, I'm not sure why it's one sixth. I know why the minus one is there. It's just to take away the 100% part of the uh, formula. But um, anyway, so if you plug in your 0 0.06 that we just calculated for our I, you're gonna get what we call the equivalent monthly interest rate. And you're gonna see that it's actually quite similar to the, um, the original interest rate of 0 0.01 that we were using when we were compounding monthly. So I'm just gonna do this on my calculator off to the side here. So one plus 0 0.06 in a bracket to the power of bracket one divided by six bracket minus one. That gives 0 0.009 seven six if we round it off okay now compare that to the original point zero one that we had it's very close but it's different enough that it it makes up for the fact that we are not doing this semi-annually we're actually going to be doing it monthly but it's going to basically give us the same result okay so this is the interest rate that we're actually going to use instead of the zero point zero one All right, the next thing we need to do is calculate that monthly payment that the bank comes up with to make sure that we've paid off the, um, the uh, mortgage at the end of the 25 years. And the way they do that is with this table of values. So the way this table of values is broken up, first of all, I want you to notice it's for every $1,000 of a mortgage. So we're gonna have to divide our mortgage by 1,000 to find out how many $1,000 there are. And it's also got columns representing the number of years for your uh, mortgage, as well as the interest rate column here based on the, the interest rate itself. So we're doing a 12% interest rate for 25 years, which gives us this 10.318996, which I'm gonna round off to 10.319. So you can see that that's the number that I got here. That's called your blended monthly factor. And that factor is for every thousand dollars borrowed. So how do we calculate what you're gonna to have to pay every month is we take the 112,450, 112, which was your original mortgage, we divide it by 1,000, and we multiply it by 10.319. And I'm doubting that that's the right mortgage, but I'm pretty sure it is. Let me just go check. Yes, it is. Okay, so if I multiply those three things together, 112,450, divided by 1,000 times 10.319 gives 1,160.37. And that's going to be our monthly payment in our table. All right, so if I go to our table here, all the way down this monthly payment section here that same amount gets put here so you're gonna be paying that for 25 years every month okay so think about that that's times 12 times 25 right so we could actually calculate how much we're gonna pay for this house right now by multiplying it by 12 and then by 25 but we'll come back to that how do I calculate my interest portion well if we follow what I showed uh, in the previous um, table, we're going to multiply this 112,450 by our interest, which is 0 0.09, uh, what did we say it was? We rounded it off to, hold on a second. My memory's horrible, 976. So you're just going to multiply your principal times 0 0.00976 you're going to find what that answer is. You're going to subtract this number by that number to give you this number. And then you're going to subtract these two numbers to give you this number. And you're going to do that over and over and over again. But we have a tool to help us do that in the form of a spreadsheet. So I'm hoping you can see this. And um, 
I've already shared this document with you a little while ago for the compound interest in annuities. I just added a tab here for the amortization. So you can go back and, and, uh, and look at that in the Google Classroom if you'd like once we're done. But we're not gonna do the monthly one just to save some time. Uh, I've already jumped right to the Canadian mortgage. So we're gonna do this one. I just wanna go through some of the ways that I set up this table. So actually I'm gonna just erase these. Okay, so here's my mortgage, 112,450. Here's the semi-annual interest rate, and you'll notice that I actually got the spreadsheet to calculate that. 12 divided by 100, it was 12%, divided by two for semi-annual. And then I got the spreadsheet to calculate the equivalent interest rate as well. So one plus the I, which was B22, to the power of one sixth minus one. So that's the calculation there. My blended monthly payment, I also got the spreadsheet to calculate. B21, which is your mortgage here, divided by 1,000 times 10.319. So I'm hoping you can all see this. I know it's a little bit small, but that's just the formula that's in that cell to calculate that amount. Now that monthly payment we know is the same all the way down this chart. Now the problem is if I try to drag this, I wanna show you something here. If I copy this cell over to here, so the cell's entry is E21, if I say that this cell way over here is equal to E21, it's gonna give me the contents of that cell, but if I try to copy it down by dragging down this corner, it doesn't give me the same number all the way down. And that's because I24, when I drag it down to I25, the spreadsheet automatically changes E21 to E22. And if I go down to the next one, it changes it to E23. I don't wanna do that. I want E and 21 to stay the same all the way down. Well, look at how you do that in a spreadsheet. Again, I hope you can see this. If you put a dollar sign in front of the E and a dollar sign in, fr in front of the 21 of a cell address, what you're telling the spreadsheet to do is to lock the E and the 21 so that they don't change. And therefore, if I grab the corner of this square and drag down, it's gonna give me the same value all the way down. And you might say, well, sir, couldn't you just copy all the way down? Sure, but if I wanted to change this value later on to another blended monthly payment, by changing, by having it do this as a copy of that cell, I don't have to copy it again. It'll just update automatically to whether, whatever that new number is. So I don't know how much spreadsheet work you've done in the past, folks. I'm telling you that spreadsheets are gonna be one of the most important tools you use if you continue on in physics and, uh, sorry, <laughs> science and math. I'm gonna be biased towards physics. Um, I used them all the time, all right? They're extremely useful. And if you know those little tricks like that, it's just gonna help you out. So, and you can lock either the letter or the number or both. Okay, now why would you wanna lock the letter? That's if you can, if you, uh, if you actually slid this to the left or right, it would normally change to from uh, E to F to G to H. But um, if you lock the letter, then it stays at E as well. Okay, so let's do all of the math that I showed you on the table uh, on paper here in the spreadsheet. So how do we calculate our interest portion? Well, we take the principal, which is G25, and we multiply that by our interest, which is our B23. And I don't want B23 to change because it's gonna be multiplying the same interest all the way down this table. So you'll notice that I locked the B and the 23 in place by putting the little dollar signs in front of them as well. The G25 will change and that has to change because I want that to change to whatever the new principal value is down the G column. How do we calculate our principal portion? Well, our principal portion is our monthly payment minus our interest portion. So I wanna put a little formula in here that says subtract this number by that number. So I'm gonna say equals, that's not an equals, sorry. Equals this number minus this number. And it does the subtraction for us. And then in this column, I wanna do the subtraction of your principal minus the 63. So I'm gonna write equals that column minus that column, or that cell, I should say. And now it's done all of the calculations for us in those first few cells. And what's nice is if I now go to the corner and drag down, 
it's going to fill in all of those values for me. Now, this is only going for the 10, first 10 payments. That isn't even a full year. We have to go for a full 25 years. So I just want to calculate how much is 12 times 25? So that's 300. So I have to go 300 rows down with this, right? So I'm going to select just the first, the last four rows here so that I have the pattern of 7, 8, 9, 10 changing here. And I'm going to drag that all down and see what's happening. It's actually filling out the rest of the chart for me, but I have to go down 300 rows. So I'll check every so often here. We're getting closer. Now look at what's happening to our uh, our three last columns. Remember that this column is the monthly payment one. It doesn't change. But this was the interest portion, and this was the principal portion. See how the interest portion keeps going down, but the principal portion keeps going up. And again, this is the bank making sure that they're going to get the majority of your money as interest before you start paying off your principal. Okay, so they slowly uh, change how much you're paying to interest. And we're almost there. Oh, I went a little too far. So there's our 300th payment. I'll just delete these cells. And at the 300th payment, we've got $11.21 left to pay off. We're doing a little bit of overkill here. Um, Sorry, we have a uh, 1,148.27 to pay off, my mistake. We're paying 1,149.17, so we're going just a little bit below zero, but that's the date where we're gonna finish paying off that mortgage. And again, look at how the interest payments at the very end get smaller and smaller and smaller, and now we're almost fully paying off the principal of our loan by the time we're done paying off the loan. And that's how an amortization table works. Now this also allows us to calculate how much money are we actually gonna pay for this house. Since we're paying 116037 every month for 300 months, we can multiply 300 by that value. And this $112,000 house is going to cost us $350,000 at 12% interest. And this is why people try to get the shortest possible mortgage. Or if they can double up on payments every month, uh, sometimes they'll try to do that. But the quicker you pay off that principal, the less interest you're going to pay. I mean, that's all, that's like, what is that? Three times the amount of the house. And that's how mortgages work. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last lesson that's gonna be done live for this year. Yeah, and uh, like I said, house uh, house prices here are. Uh, Chat just mentioned that house prices today are a lot more than this, and but the nice thing is interest is lower, but still, yeah, your house prices are are quite a bit higher. So here's what I'd like to do. I'm actually going to stop recording because that's the end of the finance lesson.